the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. So in the quarterly newsletter, I talked about our movie night a couple weeks ago that we had amongst our family, and we saw October Sky, uh, which was a story about these boys in Colwood, West Virginia, uh, striving to change their fortunes. Uh, if you were born in Colwood, West Virginia, in all likelihood, your journey led into uh, the coal mines, uh, the depleted coal mines. Uh, and the young men were acutely aware that that was their likely outcome. Uh, football seemed to be the only escape from that, uh, but they had uh, higher ambitions or different uh, ambitions, and it took a Herculean uh, uh, might on their, uh, on their half to be able to, to get beyond uh, those low horizons that, that, that their birthright set for them. Uh, and it wasn't just being born in Colwood, it was their parents' expectations for them, it was poverty, uh, it was in some cases alcoholism and, 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 and abuse, uh, but their course in life was fairly well set uh, apart from their incredible efforts uh, and, and people that came into their lives to help them uh, change that course. Uh, it, um, it's quite striking how much we are a product of how we were born. I remember in college, I got the opportunity to spend a week on an a Indian reservation in Arizona, and one day we went to the juvenile detention center. Uh, and while we were there, I was talking to a, a boy that was about Laura Lee's age, uh, and not much taller than Laura Lee, about uh, nine years old. Uh, and I asked him why he was there, and he said, well, I stole a car. So the first thing is I'm sizing him up, and I want to know how. Uh, <laughs> He said he did have some help and that you know, he was kind of below the, the, the windshield, but that he uh, had a, an older brother or cousin that was helping him. Uh, and then my second question was trying to figure out what his end game was. Uh, I mean, a nine-year-old with their own car. Uh, I, so I asked him, I said, well, why would you steal a car? I said, you know you were going to get caught. You, you live on the reservation. And he said, you know, it's not much different in here than it is outside. He said, my parents uh, and everyone else don't want us to leave the reservation. Uh, we've seen it for generations, uh, and I mean, it, it was people have written about the incredible clarity uh, that these young people on, on, on this reservation in particular uh, have about their lives uh, and about the future of their lives. And they know they were born into this reservation. No matter what they do, uh, in all likelihood, they will stay on the reservation with very limited horizons. Um, we also uh, we also are faced with that as we uh, as we do our ministry as we uh, as we have dug deeper into the learning starts early ministry we've realized uh, that statistically uh, the number one indicator of whether you will be incarcerated as an adult is whether you started off kindergarten adequately prepared the number one indicator. And the number one indicator of whether you're prepared for kindergarten in this day and age uh, where we don't have uh, adequate preschool resources is who you were born to. Bishop Gulick, uh, in a particular sermon, uh, said the most important decision that he ever made. Now, if Barbara Gulick, his wife, was here, I would say that was the second most important decision that he ever made. Uh, but he said the most important decision that he ever made uh, was choosing his parents. He said he struck the lottery uh, when he chose his parents. Uh, not just because uh, they were wonderful people, uh, but because of the seven billion people that occupied this earth throughout the whole compass of history, he was born to these two particular people in this particular age, and it has made all the difference in the course of his life. The two people that brought him into the world, uh, the comfort uh, that he has been born into, uh, the affluence that he has bo been born into, the level of education he has been born into, uh, and the nurture for him to thrive and succeed that he has been born into, the people that have surrounded his, his family uh, have all been absolute indispensable contributors to his success. There is no question about it. He hit the lottery. Most of us, no matter how difficult some aspects of our childhood might have been, have to admit uh, that when you look at the seven billion people, when you look at the whole course of history, we've probably hit the lottery with our parents. I certainly hit the lottery with mine. My children are still discerning. Uh, <laughs> but what if being Christian meant, what if being Christian meant you put your lottery ball back into the hopper? What if it meant that you put your status in life, all that you were born into, back into the hopper? 
And in some ways, that actually is what it means to be Christian. It means uh, that we are in solidarity with all of our brothers and sisters, all of God's beloved children, uh, and that we do put our, our ball back into the, the hopper. Uh, but I want you to think about that and hold on to that as we dig a little bit further uh, beneath the surface of the gospel for today. Nicodemus has something going on in his heart. Uh, the gospel writers are not really the Tolstoy or Dickens of their day. They don't give any extra details. They clearly weren't paid by the word. Uh, so we have to add a lot of the narrative to the story. But all we do know uh, is, that, uh, is that Nicodemus is willing to risk everything. Even going in the middle of the night, there is a huge risk for him going to see Jesus. Uh, best case scenario for him is that he realizes that Jesus isn't who he says he is, that he's... Uh, just kind of a, a very smooth talker, and then he can go back to his, uh, his, his way of life. Uh, but there's something about Jesus that makes him go in the middle of the night, that compels him to take all that, uh, that his birthright has given him and to go in the middle of the night to see Jesus. And Jesus doesn't turn a miracle. He doesn't even try to convince him uh, to follow. In fact, the story is very much like the rich man who comes to see Jesus. Do you remember the story of the rich man? The rich man comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, what must I do to inherit uh, eternal life? And Jesus looks at him, and this is probably the most important part of the entire story, and he loved him. And he said to him, you need to give up your riches. And he went away dejected. Because what was standing between that man and following the gospel was his stuff. What he says to Nicodemus, you've got to be willing to step away from your birthright. You did win the lottery. In the first century, where birthright is infinitely more important than all the things I just described at the beginning, he hit the lottery, as far as a Jewish person in that particular time and place could be. He is a religious leader. He's uh, respected. He can uh, follow his family lineage back, uh, which is probably how he got the status that he has. He ended up at the top of the heap, in a very difficult heap to climb. And what Jesus is telling him, you need to be willing to put your ball back into the hopper. Can you do that? Can you be in solidarity with all of your brothers and sisters who have that same truth in baptism when they come out of the water and the heavens open up and the spirit descends and says, this is my child, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Are you willing to give up everything? Remember the temptations of Jesus in the desert we talked about last week. Power, earthly goods, and trusting in God. And all three are tugging at Nicodemus. And Jesus knows it. And he says, are you willing to suspend uh, the clarity that you get from the law, the status that you get from who you were born to, and follow me? Trust in the power of the Spirit to transform your lives, to live a transformed life. Are you willing to do it? Nicodemus is struggling. In fact, we know that Nicodemus can't because he leaves, and then in the seventh chapter, we see that he's still part of the establishment. Uh, he's still a, a, a Jewish leader, so uh, he clearly hasn't followed. But what I'd like to imagine is taking place, and this is me writing the movie, uh, is that uh, in his head, like the lottery box, uh, like the, the, the hopper, uh, those balls are still spinning around, and the words of Jesus are resonating inside his head, uh, and he hasn't been able to put them out of his head. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to the end that all that believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. But God came not to condemn the world, but to save it, that he must be lifted high. All of these balls, all these words just bounced around in Nicodemus' head. And when he was there at the foot of the cross, when he sees Jesus nailed to the cross, all of a sudden those words start to, to just bounce more, more frantically around in his head and he starts to realize with absolute clarity what Jesus was talking about. That Jesus nailed to a cross had to be raised up. Uh, that, and when Jesus says those words to all uh, of the people, that all the people could hear uh, to, 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 the, to his Father in heaven, uh, Please forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He realizes the truth and that he didn't come to condemn the world but to save the world. And when he gave his life and breathed his last, he realized those words of 316, that 
God so loved the world that he gave his only son to the end that all that believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And all of a sudden, in that moment, those balls collided and he realized the transforming power of the gospel. And that's when he stepped outside, when he had the courage to step outside and to go to the, uh, the establishment and say, can I have the body? And he prepares Jesus' body for burial, acknowledging that he believes this is the Son of God, acknowledging that he's willing to step outside of all the comfort level, all the things that his ping pong ball got him in life, to be transformed from above. So I invite you, on your Lenten journey, to have the courage to let those balls ruminate inside your head, to put your ball, that lottery ball that you have, in the hopper, and to be transformed. To understand your true identity is from above, a beloved child of God. Amen.